What's up everybody? Dr. G here and uh, today we're going to do a lesson on the quantum harmonic oscillator. So what is that? Well first of all before we uh, bring quantum mechanics into uh, the discussion what's a harmonic oscillator? Well uh, here's the uh, equations for a harmonic oscillator that's the potential energy function one-half kx squared. Right, So you may have seen this before in, in an introductory physics class where this is basically the potential energy of a spring if you stretch or compress a spring, the potential energy goes up. So it basically depends on how far uh, its position deviates from its equilibrium point. And then, of course, uh, the force function, F equals minus Kx. Uh, that is the function that uh, determines the force on the mass, right? So you notice there's a negative sign, right? Because this is a restoring force, right? It fights back from, you know, if, if you push it to the left, it pushes to the right. If you, if you pull it to the right, then it, it pulls left, right? It, it always goes against uh, the displacement. So that's why there's a negative sign. And then, of course, you have a spring coefficient, k. The higher that is, the stiffer the spring. And also uh, worth noting is that, uh, you know, the potential energy function is related to the force function. As we've seen before with the conservative uh, fields, if you take the negative gradient of the potential energy function, then you're going to get the force function. And so that's what we're seeing here, right? We're only in one dimension, so the negative gradient is just a negative derivative. So if you take negative dv dx, that gives you the force function. And this is true for conservative fields. And the uh, potential energy function of a harmonic oscillator is an example of a conservative field. So now let's start bringing some quantum mechanics uh, into the discussion. So of course, we're gonna have to bring in the Schrodinger equation. Uh, so here we have the Schrodinger equation, uh, and this is the Schrodinger equation specifically for a harmonic oscillator. And first of all, take a look at this. Uh, hopefully you've seen my, my previous videos uh, on quantum mechanics leading up to this one. Is this the full Schrodinger equation, or is this the time-independent Schrodinger equation, right? So is time dependence in here? What do you think? Maybe pause it for a second, think about it. And uh, this is time-independent, right? There's no time in there. And so there's two clues, right? There's little psi. And there's no t, right? There's no, uh, uh, you know, it's not big psi of x and t, right? It's just uh, little psi of x. So this is the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which, you know, for, for many things we want to do, this, this, this has us covered. Um, and so also looking at this uh, Schrodinger equation, uh, you know, maybe think back to when you saw the particle in a box, right? That We had a Schrodinger equation for that, too, in one dimension. And uh, does this look pretty similar to you? It should, right? It should look real similar. There's only one difference here. And of course, that's the potential energy function. Uh, so here we have 1 half kx squared, right? That's a potential energy of a uh, harmonic oscillator. Uh, or, you know, we could say of a spring, right? This is a sort of a, a linear approximation of a spring is how I like to think of uh, harmonic oscillator. Where, you know, it's linear in terms of the force. So yes, uh, our potential energy function V of x in this particular case is 1 half kx squared. All right, so uh, you know in uh, previous examples, you've seen the process of finding a wave function that satisfies the Schrodinger equation. And basically, that's, that's, we're solving a, a differential equation. That's, that's what we're doing, a differential equation. We're answering the question, what fun function or family of functions satisfies this relationship uh, for the function's derivatives, right? That's that's pretty much what differential equations always comes down to, right? Much easier said than done, right? It's hard to do, but th th that's the principle of it. So uh, let's now take a look at some known solutions to the Schrodinger equation for the harmonic oscillator. So again, this is basically, you know, what, what functions psi of x would satisfy this? And I'm basically going to jump ahead and just show you the solutions uh, because, you know, we've it, it, they're not super straightforward to uh, derive on your own. And again, like basically, um, when they were first solved, people relied on some previous solutions that mathematicians had already found, right? Remember, we've, we've seen this, this sort of trick before. Can you manipulate uh, your problem into something that has a known solution and then use that known solution? And then you can always map back to the, the original way of stating the problem after you have the solution. Um, but anyway, so this is, uh, this is what the solutions look like. Uh, so we see this uh, this equation down here, right? This uh, psi of nu, that uh, that little uh, letter, it looks like an italic V almost, but uh, it's actually nu. It's the Greek letter nu. And that is our quantum number here. So again, we have uh, integer quantum numbers. So just like the particle in a box, 
particle in the box went one, two, three, four, right? The, the positive integers. Now we also have to include zero. So notice I put the zero in bold uh, font so that you would notice it. Uh, so again, we have a quantum number. It is new. And again, it just emerges out of the mathematics. It wasn't that, um, you know, basically this, this wasn't just fit ad hoc, right? This, this came out of the mathematics. This came from solving the Schrodinger equation uh, that basically um, there isn't a single solution here. There's a family of solutions, just like with the particle in a box. And um, the relationship's a bit more uh, complicated than the particle in a box, but the, in principle, it, it's that sim similar approach where you have a family of solutions and uh, there is a quantum number again. Um, so for this one-dimensional system, we have a single quantum number nu for a harmonic oscillator. And um, so you'll notice that h, h sub nu of y, what is that? Well, that is, uh, that is something called a, a, a Hermite polynomial. And again, this is, a, this is a family of polynomials. There are a solution to a, a previous uh, a differential equation that uh, some mathematicians would work out. And uh, so this is the family of solutions. They follow this pattern here. And this is so commonly used that like in some software like Mathematica, they even have a function for calling Hermite polynomials because they know, you know, people who use Mathematica are often interested in quantum mechanics and, and having access to the Hermite polynomials is nice. But so here we have a table that shows the first seven uh, Hermite polynomials at the bottom right there uh, for different values of nu, right? We have zero through six, and then the, the polynomial that corresponds to that. And also notice that um, the, the Hermite polynomials are a function of y, whereas our wave function is a function of x, right? The, the variable for our wave function is position x. But we define something called y here, where y equals x over alpha, and then we have alpha defined next to that. So I'm looking over here now, right? So, uh, and there's our definition of alpha, right? It has uh, uh, h bar, mass, and the spring coefficient, right? How stiff your spring is. And uh, so basically, this, these are, these are uh, the form of the solution, right? So that basically those polynomials, rather than necessarily having to write them out each time, it, it makes more sense to have that abbreviation, right? h sub nu of y. And of course, uh, we have to address the n, right? n sub nu, that is a normalization constant. Notice that it's not just n, right? It's n sub nu. So hmm, maybe uh, maybe there's something's a little different with the normalization constant this time around. Uh, also notice that uh, these are called uh, orthogonal polynomials. So that ends up being important, right? Because we talked about things like orthonormal basis sets. So keep an eye out for that. Um, here is a known property of uh, the Hermite polynomials. So notice if you, uh, if you take two different Hermite polynomials, uh, so in this case, uh, the notation is uh, h sub nu prime and h sub nu, and, uh, and then multiply that by e to the minus y squared, and y is defined above there if you forget what that is, and you integrate that over all y. So from, uh, integrate that uh, from all values of y, negative infinity to positive infinity. And if you do that, if you use two different values of nu, the integral comes out to zero. But if you use the same values of nu, the integral comes out to, uh, let's say, square root of pi, two to the nu times nu factorial. Interesting. So why do you think this integral is important? Think about, uh, you've seen this before, where if, uh, if two quantum numbers match, we got one value for an integral, and if they didn't match, you got zero. Think about that. Maybe pause it for a second. Think. And uh, yeah, the, this is the, the orthogonality that makes uh, these uh, solutions, these Hermite polynomials, uh, part uh, make up solutions of an orthonormal basis set. Right. So this was a really important property, and this allows us to, to come up with these linear combinations uh, so, so that basically these, these functions sort of span the space of all possible states you can have. So remember we saw this with the quantum harmonic oscillator. Remember we used the FET simulator and we came up with superposition states where we combined the different eigenstates, right? We made linear combinations of them that we call superposition states. So uh, that was possible because they form an orthonormal basis set. Um, so basically that's what's, what's going on here again. So now let's think about this. Uh, I didn't tell you what n sub nu is yet, right? We don't know what our normalization constant is. Uh, but given the information below, what do you think the normalization constant looks like? 
So I've got uh, choices A, B, C, and D uh, to the right there. So I want you to pause it, think about it, and then hit play again, and then you'll see the answer. So uh, there's our answer. It, it should be around that, right? Because basically, you know, we have an integral that's either zero or that constant down there that's that di that changes depending on what new is, right? Um, but what we want it to be is we want it to be zero or one, right? So what do you do? You have to divide by that quantity. Um, but we want the probability density function to be one. So we don't just divide by that value. We have to divide by the square root of that value, right? Because you have to multiply your wave function by its complex conjugate in order to get a probability density function. So it's sort of anticipating that step. So that's why it's going to be uh, roughly one over the square root of that value. And it ends up being quite close to that. So basically, here is the uh, normalization process that uh, is, is outlined in, in the textbook. And um, so let's go through it. So here is the process of normalizing uh, the wave functions for the uh, quantum harmonic oscillator uh, straight out of the textbook here. And uh, we see that uh, it's the usual process, right? Look over here. We have psi star psi, right? That's the complex conjugate of psi multiplied by psi. You integrate over all space. Right, that's that. That's the integral. But then, if we look at this function, uh, it's in terms of y, not x. So why don't we just translate that in, into uh, y instead of x? So that's what's going on here. And you see that an alpha appears, and you're like, "What the heck? Why do we have an alpha? Where'd that come from?" Well, notice the change in variable. Look at the bottom left here. We see that um, you know y equals x over alpha. That's how we defined y, right? We y was made up for for convenience. And uh, so that, that's the relationship. You bring the alpha to the other side and then look at the differential for both of them. And uh, yeah, that's what we have. We got uh, alpha times dy is the same thing as dx. So that's that's how you map from one to the other. It's just a multiplication by alpha. So that's why we have to include the alpha here is because we switched to dy. So the alpha is out here. We can leave that be for a moment. And then uh, so psi star psi, what is that? Well, it's these, these Hermite polynomials here. Um, and uh, so it ends up being squared, right? Because there's no uh, there's no imaginary component uh, in this expression here, right? There's no square root of negative one. There's no i, right? So um, yeah, we multiply that through, take the take the integral, uh, because this is this is a known one, and it ends up being almost exactly what we thought it was going to be. There just there's that alpha in there because there was that change of variable. So uh, now we know the normalization constant. And note that, you know, unlike the normalization constant for a particle in the box, right, that one only depended on the length of the box. If you knew the length of the box, you knew the normalization constant. That was it. But now you also need to know uh, what quantum state are you in, right? So the normalization constant is going to de depend on um, uh, the quantum state. So your, your quantum number is uh, basically, a, um, you have to plug that in to get the normalization constant. So don't forget that. All right, so you've seen uh, the equations for the solutions to the quantum harmonic oscillator, but let's take a look at these things and let's use the, the FET uh, simulator from uh, University of Colorado uh, Boulder where um, they have this really great simulator for us. So remember, you've, you've seen this before. This is the uh, particle in a box, right? This is a square potential, they call it, right? But we call this the, the one-dimensional particle in a box, right? And these are the solutions that we've seen before. Right? You've seen these as the probability density functions of you know where we would find the particle if we were to make a measurement and uh so that's probability density function and of course we can also see the wave functions instead right and notice how uh you know the wave functions are uh moving in time right but these are stationary states right because there's only one of these energy levels selected right so if i is go to probability function the probability density function is stationary Right? But the wave functions are always moving, right? So the wave functions are moving, but the probability density functions are stationary when we've only selected one eigenstate, right? We can do superpositions, right? We can do linear combinations of these states, and then the probability density function will move too, right? So that's a quick review. Now let's look at the uh, quantum harmonic oscillator. So instead of a square potential, now we want the harmonic oscillator potential, right? So this is a parabola. And uh, notice here we're looking at the probability density function. Uh, let's go to the, all the way down to the ground state. And it has this shape. It, see how it looks maybe a little pointier 
than um, the particle in the box, right, for the ground state. And as you'll see, like, they're actually quite different. Um, but, uh, yeah, so this one has a similar shape to the ground state for the particle in the box, but it's actually a different functional form. But it only has one, like, bump, right? It's, it's, it's uh, monomodal. There's, only, there's one peak to this thing. If I click here, now we have a bimodal distribution, right? So the first excited state here, um, now our first excited state, uh, we, we have, you know, again, two bumps like that. So there's, there's one node. There's one node in the middle. So we're kind of seeing this similar pattern that, that uh, we saw that like, you know, the, the lowest energy state doesn't have any nodes in the middle, right? You could say the wave is not waving on the ends, fine. But in the middle, there, there, there are no nodes for the ground state. But if you go up one level, now we have a single node here. If we go up again, now we have two nodes here, right? You keep going up, there's more nodes. But what do you notice looks different about these probability density functions compared to the probability density functions for the particle in a box, right? Just our square potential. All right, so they're, they're, the difference is, look at how tall the peaks are on the ends. All right, the peaks are, are and the higher we go, let's, let's pick a real high one. All right, see how much probability density is hanging out on the ends. So think about that for a moment. If this is a harmonic oscillator. This is sort of like a quantum, this is like a quantum version of a mass bouncing on a spring. Right, we talked about that earlier. Um, so if you think about it, well, you know, why would you be more likely to observe the particle on the ends than you would in the middle? The, the ends are now more likely uh, to, to see the particle than the middle. Right? It's, you know, if you look at each one of these peaks individually anyway, right? Um, you know, the, the, the biggest peaks are on the ends, right? So why is that? What do you think? Well, maybe pause the video and think about it. Uh, but these are what we call turning points, right? So if you think of a, a spring bouncing up and down or a mass bouncing up and down on a spring, it has to, you know, in, in, in a classical system, it has to hit like zero velocity as it turns around, right? If you reverse direction, you must have hit zero velocity at some point. Um, and so basically it's that turning point. The fact that you have to turn around there to get the other way around, that's sort of what we're seeing here with uh, the quantum harmonic oscillator. Now, you know, dynamics in a quantum system are not the same as classical, but we do still see this manifest, which I think is interesting. All right, so now, now let's look at the wave functions. So we looked at the probability density functions. Now let's look at the wave functions. And of course, these were all probability density functions uh, of a single eigenstate here. So let's, uh, let's look at the wave function. Wave function, of course, is moving. All right, and uh, we know we can look at some that are a little higher. All right, so this is kind of a similar deal, right? You, you know, you multiply these wave functions by their complex conjugate, and you get a probability density function, right? That's the relationship between this and this, right? So same as before, it's just that the shape of the potential energy function has changed. That's all we've changed in, in going from the quantum particle in a box that we did before to the uh, quantum harmonic oscillator. So let's look at a superposition state now. Let's combine, uh, let's see here, I'm gonna hit clear, and let's combine the ground state and the first excited state. So I'll just set them both equal to one and then I'll hit normalize, All right? So this is, uh, uh, the, you know, the square root of 0.5, right? Is 0.71, that's, that's rounded, right? We hit normalize, and we hit apply, and then we'll close this, and let's take a look. So now you see the probability density function moving. And uh, if you remember the, the quantum particle in a box, the square potential, uh, it, it moves kind of similarly, right? Because this, this is this, that similar deal where we have the, um, uh, you know, there's, there's, two, there's two peaks in the first excited state, right? There's that one node in the middle, which means two peaks. Uh, let's try a different superposition state. Let's see. Let's do some higher energy ones. Let's just, uh, you know, you could do more than one. Let's just throw a few in here willy-nilly, huh? Actually, let's, let's, let's add some of all of them. I'm going to set them all equal to one going from the ground state all the way up to, let's go all the way up to the sixth excited state because that was the one that was um, shown in, uh, your textbook, right? There was that ter uh, there was that uh, chart of the Hermite polynomials, right? And there was it was on an earlier slide too. Um, that's a family of solutions uh, to a differential equation that produces those polynomials. Um, 
and, and it works for any integer, right? You can have any integer zero. Remember, they start at zero, so that's different from the square uh, particle in a box, too. Um, but that integer can be any integer value. So that chart just stopped at six because, hey, you have to start stop somewhere, right? So, all right, we normalize that, and let's, let's look at what it looks like if we put um, a superposition state where we have combined an equal amount of all wave functions uh, going from the ground state all the way up to uh, setting our quantum number equal to six. So I'll apply that. And now we have this. So now our probability density function, basically where you observe the particle, you know, it, it, it's kind of going left to right. It's bouncing back and forth. Right? I remember how I, I told you that like, you know, the higher energy things go, the, uh, uh, the less, um, how can I say it? The less pronounced quantum effects are, right? So let's let's throw even more uh, higher energy states, and let's see if we can get this thing to look kind of more like a mass bouncing left to right on a spring. Because honestly, it kind of already does, right? We're seeing the probability density function uh, bounce back and forth from left to right. So let, let's let's add even more. I'm just gonna keep going with this. Let's. Uh, I'll add. Uh, here, I'm gonna clear it. I'm going to set them all equal to 1. Oops. All right. So I put a 1 in all of them. Now I'm going to hit normalize. Now I'm going to hit apply. And let's see what this looks like now. Nate. <laughs> oh, wow. Look at how, how, how skinny that peak is getting. Right, so when the when the when it gets closer to the center, what we're seeing is that we're starting to get a very narrow distribution of where that particle uh, could be. So um, basically, you know, when it when it's uh, in the turning points, right, lower kinetic energies, we're seeing that sort of uh, more wave function that it it doesn't have exactly nodes, right, but it has uh, uh, peaks and valleys, right, because it has to be it has to touch the uh, um, has to touch the uh, x-axis to be truly a node but we're kind of seeing more more wave-like structure uh, on the ends and in the center that's 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 like a single peak so that's kind of interesting too anyway so play with this thing and uh, get a feel for it and just for fun let's look at the wave function too because that's probably pretty wild looking oh that's cool neat All right, so now that we've gotten to take a look at uh, what the, some of these things look like in motion using a simulation, uh, let's return to the formalism now. Uh, because, you know, a major motivation behind creating these, uh, what we call toy models of quantum systems, uh, is that we can get analytically solvable systems for building intuition. So we should do a little more analytical work as well, since that's, you know, that's kind of the main point of doing uh, toy models. Uh, because if you wanted to simulate something like, um, if you wanted to do pen and paper quantum mechanics of a, a very small molecule like uh, the the active ingredient in ibuprofen, right? That's that that's a small organic molecule, and and you couldn't really do anything by hand of of, of much value, right? You need a computer to do things, uh, to to do quantum mechanical calculations with a, a molecule uh, with that many atoms, and it's not that it's that big of a system, but it's just it's it's too big to really do. Um, much with by hand in terms of the, the quantum mechanics of the molecule. So uh, that's why we have these toy models. So I thought, let's let's keep going with some of the analytical work here. Um, and you know, let's so first let's uh, let's learn about the energy levels, right? Remember you had uh, you had an equation for the energy levels for the quantum particle in a box. And remember the 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 only thing that changed in was that quantum number n, right? And n squared is in that uh, that relationship that shows you the levels. Uh, the quantum energy levels uh, for the particle in a box. So let's take a closer look at uh, these solutions and you know see what we can learn uh, about the energy levels for a quantum harmonic oscillator. So the thing about a harmonic oscillator is that its potential energy uh, depends very much on its position, right? So with the particle in a box, it was basically kind of on or off, right? If, if it was inside the box, its potential energy was zero. If it was outside the box, it shot up to infinity immediately, right? So that's a kind of a on-off switch for our, our potential energy. For a harmonic oscillator, it's it's gradual. It's a smooth function now. 
And uh, so we need to know its position. We need to be able to talk about, if we want to know the average, let's say the average uh, potential energy. If we want to know average potential energy, you need to know average position because the potential energy depends on the position. Um, so as far as like determining like a, an average value of a property, right? That's basically what we call this in quantum mechanics is its expectation value. And you'd call it that in statistics too, right? This is a statistical property. And the way that you get the expectation value is that equation uh, shown at the very bottom there. So if there's some observable omega, right? That's, that's, that's the Greek letter omega there. And if we want to observe, um, you know, all right, what's the average value of it? So when you have the omega in that, that bracket no, notation, right? You see how it's in those kind of pointy parentheses, right? That's uh, around the observable omega. Um, what we mean by that is, is what's its expectation value? So if you see something in, 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 a bra uh, in a brackets like that, that's basically saying um, what's its expectation value. And the way you get that is you put the observable, we call it sandwiching, right? You make a sandwich out of the observable. You put that between the complex conjugate of the um, wave function and, the, and and its wave function and and the the not and the regular wave function, right? So uh, that's what we see in equation eight b eleven down there. That's how we get the expectation value. And hopefully, you remember uh, remember back when we first talked about the classical particle in a box, right? I like to start with a classical particle in a box when I teach quantum mechanics because. You know, we want to separate the stuff that's the, the quantum weirdness from the stuff that's just statistics, right? And so uh, basically, if you remember that, do you remember where we had that, that sort of, we had those different weights where we said, what if we approximate where the particle is by looking at it into different bins, right? We divide it into four bins. We said, okay, it's, it's the, our box goes from x equals zero to x equals four. And it's, you know, we put it into, we, we looked at like a discrete version of it. We said, okay, what if it's, if it's between 0 and 1, 1 and 2, 2 and 3, or 3 and 4? Those are the only places it can be. And then basically you multiply the, the weight of it being in one of those particular bins by that value itself, right? Do you remember, you've seen this before, where you basically, you multiplied the observable by the probability density function and then integrated that thing over all space. That's all we're doing here, right? But so, but you just you put it in the middle right there, uh, right? Because if you if you remove this omega here, this is just uh, uh, that would just integrate to one, right? But you put the integral in that in the middle of that uh, uh, wave function sandwich here, and then you take that integral, and that will give you the expectation value for your observable omega. So what if our observable is just the position, right? Our our, our variable that that is that that's the right that's the thing we want to observe we're just saying hey we're, what's the average position of the particle what's what's the uh, expectation value for x that is what we're doing uh, on this particular slide and uh, so if we put that uh, in the equation er, sorry so so basically instead of omega we put x because in this case x is our omega it's our observable we want to observe the position so if we do that and then, uh, so we just have psi star x times psi, right? This is this is general for any 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 type of wave function, right? But now now we go to the right of that equal sign, and we're looking specifically for the quantum harmonic oscillator, right? So we've plugged in uh, the wave function uh, for this exact case. That's all we've done on that first line. Uh, then what can we do? We can simplify this a bit. Uh, well, first we need to change our variable, right? Remember we had that relationship from dx to dy, right? If you just multiply by an alpha. So that's where the alpha squared comes from, right? We've, we've covered that before in, in a previous slide. So uh, an alpha squared shows up. Uh, we can bring that outside the integral because it's just a constant. Uh, and then we have uh, these two um, Hermite polynomials. You know, we have a y in the middle. So we have the Hermite polynomial h of nu times y times h of nu times e to the minus y squared. Uh, and then, of course, we've brought the normalization constant squared out and also, also the alpha. So then what we can do, now we use something that's called a, a recursion relation. And so this is from that same table, uh, 8b1. That's the same table uh, in the book that uh, we, we looked at part of it earlier that we had um, the first seven quantum numbers, right? Nu equals zero all the way up to six. Uh, we, sh uh, we showed that earlier. So this is from that same table. If you look below it, it shows this recursion relationship. Uh, that I have this blue arrow pointing to right now. So at the top left here, this is this this is the last line that we got from the previous slide, right? That's just this. So I'm putting it there so we have it as a reference. And now the recursion relation is up here at the top right. So if we look at that thing, basically what it's showing us 
is that there's a relationship between the different Hermite polynomials here. In particular, we're looking at if we're at nu, and then one above nu, and then one below nu. So like if we're looking at three different quantum numbers here, like, uh, you know, if, if nu is two, then we're going to look at one, two, and three, right? That's basically what we're, what we're saying here. And so this, there's this relationship that they have here that proves very useful to us. So basically, um, note how, you know, we have y times h nu right here, right? That's, that's part of this integral that we want to carry out here with y h nu. Well, it turns out if we rearrange this a little bit, just bring the, the y h nu to the other side, divide both sides by 2, you get this relationship here. So now we have a relationship for y h nu that we can plug in. So basically, this whole thing, we substitute that in for the y h nu, and now our integral becomes this. Uh, so once you plug that in, you, you know how it goes with integrals, right? You can either, uh, if you have the integral of the sum of functions, you can either integrate them separately or together. And so here we choose to separate that into multiple integrals. And then what do we notice? We've got Hermite polynomial for nu times Hermite polynomial for nu minus 1 here. And here we have nu and nu plus 1. Well, you know, this should, this should really uh, um, grab your attention, right? Because remember we showed that uh, orthonormal uh, property of the Hermite polynomials, right? They form an orthonormal basis set for us. Uh, with, you know, if you, you have to include the normalization constant, of course. But, uh, yeah, so this is an orthonormal basis. That, therefore, we know that this is going to integrate to zero because these don't match, right? Nu and nu minus one. These are two different quantum numbers. So basically, this goes to zero, this goes to zero. And then we learn that uh, the expectation value uh, for x is zero, right? It comes out to zero. So the mean displacement is zero. And if we think about this, this is not surprising, right? The, the, the harmonic oscillator, right? Think of a classical one. It's just something bouncing back and forth on a spring. You know, would it surprise you if its average position was, was at the equilibrium point? No, that's not, that very, that's not very surprising, right? So the mean displacement uh, is zero. So if you, if you, you know, take out, carry out the statistical mean, where, where, where's the average place we're going to find this? It's going to be right at the center, right at its equilibrium point. So not stretched, not compressed. So that's the mean displacement. And uh, you can carry out a very similar process to what we did, where uh, you'll set up the integral with x squared instead of x. And then also the recursion relationship that we, that we just took advantage of, that comes in handy again. So you use both of these same tricks again, just with x squared instead of x. Um, so I really want you to try that and figure that out on your own. And then uh, basically, here's the answer, right? So if you get this, you got it. Uh, so we've got uh, the expectation value of x squared. So that's basically, um, you know, if 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 you keep, you know, if you keep measuring x, square that, right? And you keep doing that over and over again. Uh, what's the what's the average uh, what's the average measurement you are going to get, right? It's not zero this time. Um, and uh, so it, it it turns out that this is what it is: the mean squared displacement. And you can see how why, why this is a useful thing, right? Because you know if, if this thing is is has some symmetry to it. The mean is just zero. That's not very informative. Whether this thing is bouncing back and forth like crazy or, or barely bouncing at all, you're still going to get zero. That's so you're kind of not, not learning a whole lot, right? <laughs> now I mean you're learning something. It's it's useful, but like sometimes uh, the expectation value of a squared value is actually more informative, and so that's what we're showing here. So the expectation value for x squared is this expression right here. So nu plus 1 half uh, h bar over mass times spring constant. And uh, that's uh, all uh, the square root of that down there. So this is uh, uh, so that's that value. But we can do something with this, right? So how I want you to think about this, though. How can we use this relationship to calculate the average potential energy of our quantum harmonic oscillator? How do we do that? Well, What's potential energy of a harmonic oscillator? Just forget about quantum mechanics for a second. What's the, what's the potential energy of a harmonic oscillator? 1 half kx squared, right? That's the potential energy of a harmonic oscillator. Well, we have, we have the expectation value for x squared, so we're like most of the way there, right? 1 half kx squared, here it is. So uh, for a quantum harmonic oscillator, the expectation value for potential energy is just this. We're basically plugging uh, our known solution here for the expectation value of x squared into the expression we already knew for 1 half kx squared. 
And uh, also, there's there's a more uh, you know condensed way you can write this. Um, the frequency omega. So the frequency of our harmonic oscillator uh, is the square root of the spring constant k over m. So instead of writing this, all, instead of writing all this out, you can actually just write omega, and uh, that's what that means. So here we have an expression for the mean potential energy of our quantum harmonic oscillator. So we have a relationship for the expectation value for potential energy V, right? We've got that, our mean potential energy, but can we get an expression for total energy out of that? Well, it turns out we can uh, due to something called the Virial theorem. And the Virial theorem states that for systems governed by conservative forces uh, and harmonic potentials like we're working with now for a harmonic oscillator, that is a conservative field. That's an example of one. Uh, so for these uh, conservative uh, fields and conservative forces uh, that, that emerge from the fields, uh, where the potential energy has the form V equals AX to the B, there is a simple relationship between the means of potential uh, energy V and the mean of kinetic energy E sub K. And so that expression is shown below. That's the Virial theorem. So basically, uh, well, our potential energy is 1 half KX squared. So B equals 2. Why? Because x squared, that's a 2. Uh, so then b is going to be a 2 here. You plug a 2 in, and then we learn that e sub k equals, er, sorry, the expectation value for the kinetic energy equals the expectation value for the potential energy. Well, if that's true, well, then the total energy is just going to be double the potential energy. And we already knew the potential energy. This is the potential energy. So if we want the total energy, this is the expression for that. It's just nu plus one half times h bar omega. And so this is the expression that we have for the energy levels of a quantum harmonic oscillator. So uh, here we have it, right? Here's our energy levels. And again, we could plug in uh, nu equals zero, one, two, three, as high as you want in positive integers. And then you can get a, uh, an energy level for the quantum harmonic oscillator. And just to kind of put uh, another visual to that, Here's the energy levels for the quantum harmonic oscillator. And uh, one thing I want you to notice, you know, compare this, you know, think back to what the quantum particle in a box looked like. Think about the spacing. Did the spacing change or was it constant for the, the particle in a box, right? Also known as the square potential, right? You see how this is like, this is a parabola, right? Our, our harmonic potential here. Um, but uh, yeah, think about the spacing. It wasn't constant like this, right? It, it, it changed because we had n squared, right? So they, uh, the energy levels, uh, the spacing changed, right? They got uh, further and further apart the higher you went. Whereas these, they stay constant. And that's not surprising, right? Just test one out here. If you take two uh, uh, adjacent energy levels, nu equals 3 and uh, nu equals 4, well, then if you take the difference between those things, you're going to have uh, four and a half minus three and a half. Well, that's one. And then one times h bar omega. Well, there you have it. That's not surprising. Um, so, yeah, these are the energy levels for the quantum harmonic oscillator. And that uh, concludes our lesson on the quantum harmonic oscillator. Uh, I'm Dr. G, and I will see you in the next one.